Okay, so let, okay, that's not working either. Okay, let's start. Oh, yes. <laughs> server to client, yeah. No, client to server. Client to server. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the request. Yes, from the, cli the client request to the server. Sorry? The act goes from the server to the client. Oh, okay. I'll check that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, no, I'm missing a slide. Okay. So, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the, um, you should have gotten an email uh, earlier today uh, telling you that the uh, quiz one uh, marks are posted to connect along with instructions on how to view the marked quizzes. Okay, so you, they're handed back electronically so you can go to a link and uh, look at the quiz. In addition, um, the, uh, where the marks are recorded is also the, the link there that you can see. Okay, so I so just wanted to let, let no, everyone know that. There are also some statistics there. If I recall correctly, I think the average mark was about 75% or something like that, which is pretty decent. So uh, I think that's probably a fairly, you can judge fairly well how you're doing in the course based on, on that grade. Okay, so our big themes today, um, I left you with this on Friday, was do all packets have to go to a router? And also what we're going to do is we're going to, how do you find out the MAC address of a machine? So after today, you should be able to describe and trace the role of ARP, uh, know some more about link layer header, headers, um, describe the file. Um, that should be describe the role of the network layer header in routing, uh, describe the role of the transport layer header in routing, and then given all of this stuff, uh, trace it as it goes through a network. So back to this question, does all traffic have to go through a router? Okay. So I think probably the best way to sort of get this started is to pull out some history. Okay. So <clears throat> so this is, um, well, the yellow thing, okay, is a piece of Ethernet cable. And this, so this is like first generation Ethernet cable. And yes? Circa what year? Circa what year? Oh, probably about 1982 or something like that. I don't know if there's a date on here. But it, it would be in that, it would be sort of the early 80s. Okay, so, you know, if I wanted to flog someone with this, I could do a pretty good job. <laughs> so, um, and how these things worked, not electrically, but sort of conceptually was there would be every place that you had a machine, so your ca this cable, which as you can see is very stiff, you wound that wherever it was, and then every place you had a machine, you put, on, you put in one of these boxes, and then on one of these boxes, you had a cable like this that would plug into, if I get the right end, or if I have the right cable, okay. You plug that in. It looks like a serial port, but it's not. And then you plug this into an Ethernet card in the back of your machine. And so if you had like, um, you know, so we had a collection of people along here that wanted to have Ethernet, right? Well, we would have to have one of these boxes for every one. And there's little marks on here on how close you can space them and everything like that. So this was sort of the, this would sort of predate well, kind of codate the internet, okay? They're around the, about the same time. So this is sort of, when we talk about networking and uh, MAC addresses and stuff like that, this is where this sort of all comes, starts to come from. And so initially, you had these networks and they just had machines, say this classroom. They never went anyplace else. The networks weren't connected to anything, they were just networks, 
Okay? The whole idea behind an internet is that you now interconnect these and you need to have some rules for how you're going to do that and you need to have some way of identifying the addresses that go along with this. So this would sort of be how you would start out. And back in those days, well, the internet, if it exists, barely existed at all. So there wasn't a big demand for uh, interconnecting these networks. Or maybe there was a demand and we didn't know it, but um, there certainly wasn't a demand as far as you could go do it or anything like that. And companies, uh, Ether, or Ethernet came out of 3Com, which came out of sort of uh, Xerox PARC. Um, and so if, if companies wanted networking, they would use this to, inter, uh, to connect their machines together. And that was sort of what they did. So in an environment like that, you had no notion of routing uh, in the sense of a router. You just were all on the same wire, okay? Which is very much the same as uh, in this room with respect to broadcasting and uh, the wireless component of anyway. So it's, it's similar in that respect. So if you wanted to talk to another machine, you just sort of fired your, well, your, this little box's job was to sort of say, is it okay to send? And if it is, then it would modulate it onto the wire, and if not, it would not allow you to send. That was its job, okay? And so that's why you see when we draw these pictures, we'll often draw pictures, we'll draw a line like this. That represents that big wire, right? And then we have drops where we have other machines. And so just about everything that we talk about when we, when we sort of look at some networking in that is kind of predicated on a model that looks something like this. And then what do we do is we take and we draw our big cloud around this, right, something like that. So that's one of our networks. And then we introduce a router and we connect another cloud to, together. That's, so that's how this stuff sort of gets going. So what this means is that we have these independent networks that don't need routers to get anywhere. Okay. So now our challenge is to try and figure out, okay, um, what are the addresses of these machines? What are they? How do I, I still have to have an address to send to them, like that's sort of a, uh, anytime I send some information, I've got to address it to something. So I have to have an address. So what are the addresses of these machines and how do I go out about finding them seeing as I don't have a router that has all of that information for me? Okay. So that's sort of where this is all sort of coming from. Okay. So it, that sort of kind of makes sense at the moment, at least the, the statement of the problem and where we're starting with. Okay. So. You've probably seen this in some of the readings and that, this idea of a net mask, okay? And a net mask is a, a CIDR address, um, but what it does is it tells you what the range of addresses are that are on your subnet, okay? So what they're essentially saying is all of the following addresses you can find on your subnet. So if we had something like 172.16.2.1.1, that would tell us that all of the addresses 172.16.2.0 all the way up to .255 are on potentially on your subnet. Okay. And you'll often see this written in a slightly different form. You'll see it's written as 255, 255, 255.0 and what that is, is, is a strange way of expressing this, but it says, take your Ethernet address, or not your Ethernet address, take your IP address and and it with this, okay? And that will sort of tell you what addresses are on your network, right? It's got, so if you and 255 with 172, you get 172, you get 16, you get two, and then the fact that it's zero, that's sort of the key thing there that tells you, okay, and then the zero part you can put to anything you want. And so that tells you what you're looking for. Okay, so that's how that gets expressed. <coughs> so now we know what ranges of addresses are there. And so the next thing is, okay, well, how do I actually get it there? How do I actually make sure that 
this machine, if this is the machine I want to get to, how does it actually sort of show up there? We need to sort of step back again to these things here, okay? And, and think about our friends and how they had to suffer with the speeds and stuff like that. And how the issue would be, well, if I sent every packet to every machine on that network, that would really slow down those machines. So what we want to do is we essentially want to try and filter those out so that we don't have to worry about them, okay? In addition, um, there's another sort of thing that sa says this. When you start putting together a wire like this, you're going to say, okay, well, how many different types of protocols can I run on that wire? Okay. If we all agree on what the signaling is, so that's the physical layer, and we all agree, so we have our physical layer here, then we have our link layer, and then we have our network layer. So the network layer that we've been talking about here, we've always been talking about this as being IP. Well, it turns out there are a whole bunch of other types of networking layers that are potentially out there. Okay, so there's, there's ones that are, I think there's ones, I think it's called CAN or something like that. There are ones for like office automation floors. Um, there are ones for ring type networks. Um, there's uh, the X25, which is a, a completely different standard. But if you sort of go that route, then you're saying, hey, you know what? If everyone agrees on the link layer and how it works, then that means that I don't have to, I can run different network protocols on the same wire. Provided that our link layer tells us something about the protocol that we want. So the other aspect of the link layer that it helps is it allows us to run multiple protocols or multiple network protocols on the same infrastructure that we have there. So a, a classic one that you might, um, well, they, they wouldn't do it this way now, but when one that I was working on at one point, um, a company wanted to run data and voice on the same set of wires. Uh, but they wanted to run IP for the data, but they wanted to use a proprietary protocol for voice. So what you do in a situation like that is you say, okay, we're going to use the same link layer because that's the thing that's going to control access and going to, t to send data to a, a particular phone versus a machine. Okay? And then what we'll do is we'll have a different protocol number here, one for IP, while well, there is a well-defined one for IP, and we'll have a proprietary one that we'll use for the voice. And then the link layer, it will look at it and it'll only grab the proprietary ones. So um, physical layer is like, let's say, Fiverr or Quacks or whatever. Link layer is just like everyone's agreement that it's like, how, gonna, how fast we're going to send the packets or something? No, no, that's the physical layer, how fast we're going to send the packet and how bits are represented. This is, the, the, the link layer is saying, okay, um, when I start to send the bits and you start reading the bits, how are you going to, how are you going to interpret that information? Like um, That would be part of it, but not exclusively it. It would be basically in this particular case, it says, what it actually says is you're going to have a destination, you're going to have a source, and you're going to have a protocol type. And then you're going to have data. And the data is just the stuff from the network layer. Okay? And so notice that this repeats. This is sort of almost exactly what we see at the network layer as well. Right? So it's very similar in that way. Um, except that this time all we're doing is we're just telling it what the network layer protocol is, and at the network layer it tells us what the transport protocol is. Okay? So <clears throat> now we can, so that, that allows us to distinguish these different protocol types. Doesn't that mean it's really wasteful if you're repeating the data? Well, the, the data includes the, the network header, source. sorry? I'm sorry, I just mean the destination source, if that's repeated in different layers? So the question is, is this, is this wasting stuff because the destination and source is being repeated at different layers? They're actually different addresses. So um, this is sort of akin to, I don't know how to sort of say this. Uh, let, I, I'm going to defer on that because maybe it will become clearer when I get to the next uh, aspect of this. Okay. So this is what we have to, that, that's sort of where we are and that's what we're working with. Okay. And so now our challenge is, 
Okay. If this, if I have an IP address here, okay. So I've got some machines with IP addresses. They're all on the same subnet. There's no router involved, and so now. Let's say this machine wants to send it to 81. What we want to do is we want to make sure that only, or as much as possible, only 81 gets the data. Right? We don't want 48 to get it. We're not doing this because we're friendly. We're doing this because if we go back to this, quite frankly, 48 is not interested in the data or shouldn't be interested in the data that's going between these two nodes. Because right? if you, as soon as we accept the data at a particular node, that data, that node has to start processing it. It has to do something with it. Right? And so it has to take it all the way up at least to the network layer and it's got to look at it and then maybe do something else with it. So what you want to do is you want to avoid putting any processing load on the machines higher up okay? or on the higher parts of the processor. And so that's why you sort of, you filter it out by saying, okay, this is the guy that I want it to go to. Now, the other thing I guess that's maybe not obvious from this, and I just assumed it, um, when you send the data on this yellow cable and it goes through this, it actually keeps going, right? So when this node sends the data, it goes like this, goes up to that guy, goes to that guy, and keeps going. So it's broadcast in that sense. That's why it's so similar to wireless. So it's broadcast like that. And then we have the little boxes on here that are essentially doing the filtering. Okay. So they go out and it starts sort of up there and said, nope, don't want that. So it stops paying attention to it and it doesn't bother the processor here with it. Similar to here. Okay. And whereas when this guy sends it to that one, it goes like that. Oh, lets it through and goes to there. Okay. So that's sort of the idea behind the MAC address, to say, okay, where do I want that data to go? And even in modern systems, uh, this is important. I mean, it turns out, if this is a fiber connection, and you've got fiber going like that, do you really want to be pumping you know, 10 or 100 gigabits per second at some arbitrary processor there, um, just to have that processor toss it all? I mean, I mean you, really, you really don't want to put that load up onto those processors. That takes a lot of, uh, a lot of computational power to do all of that, okay? especially when you've got lots of them doing it at once. Okay? So that's the idea behind that. And so now the question becomes, okay, if I want to send to 172 from 45 to 81, I need to find out its MAC address. So what am I going to do? Well, that's where ARP comes in, which stands for Address Resolution Protocol. And, whoops. What it does is it simply says, it's a very simple protocol. It says, who has, and then it gives the IP address. And if a node has that MAC address, it'll respond saying, I have it. Okay. So that's all that happens. And then in each machine, um, it maintains a table. And in that table is a mapping of IP addresses to, uh, to MAC addresses. And so if you, go, um, if you go onto a Linux box and you do something like uh, ARP minus A, you'll get a list of all of the machines that, are currently, that it currently knows about. And it keeps those for someplace on the order of about 15 minutes. And then it throws it out. Okay, so, it, so it doesn't keep that indefinitely. It just says, okay, 15 minutes, and that's it. So there's a couple interesting things you can do with a setup like this. Okay. So now suppose that this machine actually had or wanted to have two IP addresses on the same thing. So instead, what it wants to do is it wants to also listen to 172.16.2.46. Suppose that both of those are on the same wire. So that machine wants to respond to both of those addresses. Not just one, but both. Well, now what you do is you'd say, who has? 
172.16.2.46, and it would say, oh, I have that, and it would respond with this MAC address. Right? We've only got one way of connecting it, right? We've only got one of these boxes, so there will be two MAC, there will be one MAC address that identifies this here, but people can say that they have more than one IP address associated with that MAC address. Okay. So you'll say, okay, that's whatever that MAC address is. It's got 46 and 45 in the table. So you can build up more complicated scenarios like that. Now this also comes into place if, you're ever involved, if you've ever heard of bridging. Okay, so bridging is sort of a, a, a somewhat, it's not quite routing. <coughs> but it's similar to routing. And in a bridge, you take, say, a network like this, and you connect it up to another network, but they also have the same range of IP addresses. And so now you have a spot there, and there could be a whole bunch of IP addresses on this, in this network here, and you have to get it through that particular spot. So there's another example of using multiple MAC addresses for one IP address. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Multiple MAC addresses. No, sorry. One IP one MAC address, multiple IP addresses. If I said that the other way around, I was wrong. So if we looked at any oh any other questions? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thought in my mind is that ARP is part of a link layer, but IP addresses are part of a network layer, right? Correct. So does this mean that ARP can be used from more than just IP addresses then? Can it support other network layers? Hmm. That's a really good question. I, I don't know offhand. Um, I'd have to look that up. I don't see, I, I'm not sure. Well, should IP addresses then have a place in the link layer at all? Well, you've got, the challenge here is that someone has to know that piece of information. And so if you keep it totally separate, you, you're hooped because you can't find it out. So you're going to always have these sorts of situations where there's sort of right at the boundaries there will sometimes be strange things going on. So that would be certainly one of these situations here where it's a little bit strange because you're quite right. ARP is at the link layer, yet it's somehow dealing with uh, IP addresses. Okay. So, but it's to sort of get around this particular problem. Um, just to clarify what you said, you said um, every layer needs to have the protocol the next layer in the so, so every, oh, when I was in this, so not every layer, okay? So the link layer tells us what the network layer protocol is, and the net la network layer tells us what the transport protocol is. But does, does the transport, oh. no, because that's done by port number. Oh. Okay, so the port, so the whatever, and, sorry, and, and sort of generic agreement on that. Whereas you can actually look, um, so with respect to this protocol number here, and this one here, there are actual sort of standards and tables that say what they're going to be. And so if you hunt it around someplace, I think like for some particular reason, 80 is striking my mind as being the protocol number for one of these, um, stuff like that. Okay. Quick question, what were you talking about? So if without using a router, one node wants to send a, a data to another node, asks <coughs> who's got this MAC address, Gets it back. Yep. Then sends it there. But what if there's a scenario you mentioned about there's two <coughs> wants to send it to two or No, no. So there's a, the scenario is that a machine could be supporting more than one Mac, uh, one IP addresses off of that link. Uh, and then in that case, it would be one MAC address shows up. So, so if you, we looked at the IP addresses, we would see that that MAC address repeated for those two IP addresses. So one IP can have multiple MAC. One, no, no. <laughs> multiple IP addresses can be associated with one MAC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
So this is sort of a, so there's a, a sample type network there, okay, of what's going on. So now what I've done is I've introduced the router back in there again. Okay, so we've take, I took the router out and now I've put the router back in. And so now let's explore what happens when we want to send to different locations. So it actually turns out there's, there's sort of uh, two interesting scenarios here. Okay. okay. This is just saying what we know so far. I should do this out of order. So we're going to use ARP to get the MAC address for our local IP. We use DHCP to get IP addresses unless we have a, a static one. Routers get organized into ASs and then we use BGP to exchange routing information between ASs. Okay, so that's sort of the big picture and if we sort of look at here what happens when a packet is sent. Okay, so there's a couple scenarios. Well, what happens if let's say this guy here wants to send to one of these guys here. So first of all, we can tell we have our CIDR address or our net mask here. So everything should be, if I haven't made any typos, 133.16.2.0. So anything from 0 to 255 should be on the local network. So if we're going to send anything to the local network, that's going to be, we'll have to use a MAC address to get there. And then we also have the challenge of saying, okay, now that we've interconnected these, what happens if I want to send to something out in the broader internet? Okay, so we have a router here, okay. So one thing about a router is that it has, in this particular case, it'll have to have an address on this side of the network, on our 133, plus it has to have one to the broader internet, okay. So it's going to have a different address on that connection. So this is where the layering stuff starts to really come into play. So what's happened is we have our application and they want to send some data. So the data goes to the transport layer. Transport layer goes to the network layer. Okay. And from our perspective, we're really only interested in this part here, the, the blue part. Right. So the payload and the orange part, which is the transport layer, as far as the network layer is concerned, that's just data. The network layer is not going to do anything with it. It's just going to pass it on transparently. Okay. So in this particular case, suppose we want to send from 133.16.2.34 to 133.16.2.10. Okay. So if we back up, I should have printed off a slide. Or I should have printed something off with that. Okay. So if we want to go to 34 to 10, then we're going to need the MAC address of that guy there, if I did this properly. Okay. All right, so then what we do is we get to the network layer, network layer fires it down to the link layer, the link layer puts on the MAC address for 133.16.2.10, whatever that happens to be, right, and sends it out the wire, and then that guy will grab it. The MAC layer grabs it, but it, that's sort of all it sort of does at that point, and then it strips off the MAC header, moves it up to the network layer, and the network layer looks at the source and destination addresses. Okay. It's primarily at this particular point just looking at the source part, and it looks and says, is this my address? If the answer is yes, it then says, okay, now, let's move it up to the transport layer. So it'll pass it on up to the transport layer. Transport layer will then look at all of the information in there about sequencing, uh, port numbers and things like that to figure out what application to deliver it to. Okay. So that's what happens there. Questions? Okay, so that's one scenario. But what if we want to route to the rest of the internet? Okay. So <coughs> we've got the payload's the same, the transport's the same, 
In our IP header, our source address is, well, different because I'm coming from a different node, uh, so 129, uh, but our destination is now outside of our subnet. Okay. So the network layer can sort of figure that out because it looks at the net mask and it can say, oh, that's not an address that should be on my subnet. So that means I have to go to my router. <coughs> so it looks in its routing tables and it says, oh, I have to go from 133.16.2.129, that's me. Um, I have to get that to 133.16.2.1 was the router that I had. Okay, so I have to get it to that node. So what does it do? Well, what it doesn't do is change the IP address. What it does instead is it says, who's got a MAC address for 133.16.2.1? Hopefully somebody responds. And so what it does then, if it gets a response, it puts that now as the link header. So observe what's happened now. We haven't changed any of the IP addresses. And what's going to happen now is when that packet gets sent, let's just assume that this is our router here, it will go out along here. All of these other nodes will ignore it because they're not, they, that's not their MAC address. And eventually it'll show up at the router, and the router will look at it and say, ah, that's my MAC address. Okay, so it, it's, it's, it's MAC address. So what it does then is it moves it up to the network layer. But each of these nodes, they still do a little bit of work since they, have to, so they still have to look at the MAC address, right? They still have to look at, you're right, there's some work done by each of these nodes. They have to look at the MAC address. That's typically all done in hardware. So your Ethernet card, like these parts here, they they'd actually be looking at it for you. So it's not, it, the actual processor on your machine doesn't have to look at it. it. In theory, it could, but the way that things are put together these days, that they don't. So all the addresses, I mean, no, all the data that get, gets sent in the network, it's always broadcast. There's someone always checking, is it mine? No, it's not mine. Forget it. It's mine, I think it. <laughs> Yes and no. <laughs> so all of the data is broadcast, but this is sort of our, this is the basic model. And then what happens is that, um, okay, so the technology has changed. So just a, just a little bit of a segue or an aside. Okay, so have any of you seen any wiring like this lately? <laughs> Not likely, right? <laughs> What you have set, what you see instead is you've got a box and you have a cable coming out like that and you run the cable to your computer. Right? So you see, and this can be in the form of what's referred to as either a hub or a switch. If it's a hub, then it's just a it's just exactly like this picture, except it's in the box. Okay, so it comes in here and it gets sent down all of those wires. And then the, the part that does the filtering is on the other end of the wire. If it's a switch, <clears throat> it's a little bit smarter in that at each one of these spots, what happens is the data comes out gets fired along like that, and now the term switch comes in is it watches the link layer address, the destination address, and what it does is only if it knows that the link layer address is on the other side, like on, on, on there does it switch it through. So it's kind of like a gatekeeper in that, that at each one of these points that comes in, each one of those wires that you plug into your machine, there's a little switch there, and as the data goes by, it looks at the link address and says, oh, is the machine with that link address on the other end of that wire? If so, I switch it out to that. If not, I don't. And this gets a little more complicated and you say, well, how does it know what's on the other end? Well, it has to do with things like, like saying, okay, so initially I don't know what's on the other end of any of these. Right? So on, initially when I plug something in, I have no idea what the MAC addresses are. So what happens is that the first time a piece of traffic comes through there, 
it'll say, look at our link addresses. They have destination and sources as well. And so now it learns what's on the other side, what's on the end of those wires. And then that way what happens is after a while, after you, it doesn't take very long, um, that you can just send traffic down there and you don't disturb the others. So the switch, they're just basically sniffing and they're writing to their own memory. They're Sorry? For sniffing for uh, the MAC address? Yeah, basically they're just sniffing MAC addresses. Yeah. How do you screw that? Hubs are just, they just electrically move everything through. There's no smarts in them, right? Um, I don't know if you can even buy hubs anymore, okay? So, so they used to be fairly common, but uh, now they're probably just all switches, okay? So, but that doesn't change the model. I mean, those are just ways of allowing us to increase bandwidth because with a switch, once you have a switch in there, for example, you can have these two guys exchanging traffic and these two guys exchanging traffic at the same time. And so if you have like a gigabit switch, then you can have a gigabit going this way, a gigabit coming back this way, gigabit going that way and that way at the same time. So you can actually be moving four gigabits of traffic all at once. Whereas when you have a model that's pure like this, all you can do is a gigabit at once. Because right? you can only transmit one at a time on there and you have to share. So this is this stuff is really all about increasing the amount of bandwidth and stuff that you have available to you. It doesn't sort of change what this is. And you still have to be, and all of this stuff will drop back to the, its old behavior if it needs to. Okay, so now what happened, if, I, if you recall what happened here is our link header got it to our router, our router strips that off, it looks at the IP address, and it says, that's not for me. So it consults its routing tables and decides where it's going to go. And at that particular point, it'll do the same sort of thing again. Right? So we'll go, since that router is, if I draw another sort of cloudy type network here, Conceptually, that router will be connected to another network of which there are potentially machines off of that as well, of which there may be, if we're crossing ASs, another router that it wants to get to. So at this particular point, it says, who do I need to get to? It'll figure out what the IP address is of the router that it needs to get to, just like our local guy did figured out what's the IP address of my router, doesn't change the IP address in the packet, but instead says, okay, this is the IP address of the router I want to get to. Let's say it's this guy here. Right. And so what I will do on my Mac, I will construct a Mac address, and I will put the Mac address of this guy on it, and now it'll go across here, and this guy will grab it. And you just keep doing that over and over and over again until eventually, what should happen is you'll show up at the destination and the router that's connected like right to the very end. So if we're looking at this from the stuff coming backwards, coming back at us, when it gets to this one, it'll say, oh, where's my 172.16.2 guy? He'll go, oh, that's on this side here. What's the MAC address of that? And then you'll fire it out and it'll end up there. That guy will pick it up take the MAC address off, look at the IP address and say, ah, it's for me, I've got my packet. Okay? <coughs> so this is, actually this is just showing you that we start out like that and as it enters the router, we strip the header off and then we put the address of the MAC address of the next hop onto there and we never change the contents of the IP header. They remain constant through the whole trip. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, the network address translation, is that already happening or is we're going to have that soon? Okay, so this is not, this is, uh, not network address translation. This is just pure networking. We need to know, before we can do network address translation, we have, there's more stuff we have to know. Is that a different layer? Um, network address translation kind of 
goes across several layers, which is why it's not universally liked. Okay. Okay, any questions? Okay, so let's try a few of these. If I have, if you fire up Socrative there, I'll ha I have a... Okay. Just a moment here while I have to, I have to stop the other one and then I have to... Uh, the name of the quiz, just a sec, make sure I'm starting the right quiz. There. Okay. So, is the picture showing up properly? There should be a picture there? Okay. Because on, on, when I do it on my screen, it's all black. <laughs> so, or should I say with the, the, it, what it's showing me is it, it's all black. <laughs> Which also means that I can't see the picture. So. Oh, it's not giving you, yeah, it's not giving you any feedback. Yeah. You have to debate that with your neighbor, right? <laughs> Okay, so it looks like uh, most of you are finished. Okay. 
now I have no idea what's going to happen next year. <laughs> Okay, that didn't work. Okay, so I'm going to stop the collection here. So it's a little hard to see there. So people were gravitating towards, uh, for the first one was D, so that's pretty much on target there. Okay. This one, there's a little more, we're going towards D again. That one. Okay, so the Madra. So when machine 133.16.2.187, I have to get up here and see where that one is. Um, it's going to another one on 15, so it would use 15 would be the address that it would want. So it, whenever it's on its local area network, right, it's just going to be the MAC address of whatever that machine is. Um, so this one here. Number five, the last one is the one that people seem to be having a little more uh, disagreement with, so to speak. Right? And so the two popular answers there are B and C. So what's the MAC address used by 133.16.2 to 15 when it wants to send a packet to this one that's off the network? Okay? So we're sending from someplace on our network here to this machine here. So in this particular case, what we want to do is we want to go to the router, right? So we have to pass it through the router. And so the MAC address, when we start it out from 15, has to be the MAC address of the router, okay? So that's going to be C, this one here, the MAC address of the router, 133.16.2.1, okay? So this is a fairly common mistake. People think that um, it's the MAC address of this end guy. It's not. The only MAC addresses that you can find out are actually the ones that are connected to the same wire that you are. You can't find out MAC addresses anyplace else. Okay, so any, yeah? I see you skipped number two and number four. Sorry? I think you skipped number two and number four. Number two and number four, I think. That's possible. <laughs> Okay, there's four. Okay, so the destination MAC address is 189 when it wants to send a packet to 133. Okay, so when it's that one there, so this one is asking what is the destination MAC address of 189 when it wants to send a packet to 133. So we're outside the network into this, right? So in this particular case, there's actually nothing here to tell us. It's none of those. It would be whatever the MAC address is of the router it's on the same subnet as, okay? So in this particular case, I mean the next best get the, you know, B would be the other possibility, but given that we have a little bit of a cloud there, um, it's probably not that router. It's going to be a, a different router, okay? okay. Any questions? Yep. So if you, if, you're, if you start 133.16.1, at the internal side of the router. Sorry, yeah. You're setting to 189.26.51. Yeah. The first MAC address, the router is 142.18.34. No, it's the 132 one. So, 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 so are you talking about this question or the next question? The next question, but if you actually, <laughs> if you actually 
you started at 133.62.1. Yeah. Oh, if you started there? Yeah. Well, MAC address. Oh, okay. So if you start, if you started at that, so you'd be inside the router then. Yeah. Yeah. Then it would be the MAC address of something over here that's not. We, so it wouldn't be its own. It wouldn't be its own. No. No. Yeah. It would be putting up. Okay. Pardon? I. Uh, no, it's none, none of the above. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll finish this off on Wednesday. Thank you. 